Welcome again to the 2021 Sports Society and Social Change Conference. I am Cora Asuncion, a fourth year undergraduate student in social work at San Jose State University. I am a current intern with ISC and want to use my voice to create an inclusive and safe space for others. I have the pleasure of introducing your moderator for the first panel, Voices of Athlete Activism, Dr. Akila carter Francique. She serves as the executive director for ISC. Entering her third year, she is also an associate professor at SJSU in the Department of African American Studies. She examines the inter intersections of sport, society, and social justice, inclusive of issues of diversity, social movements, and the dynamics of social change and development. Carter Francique served as the 2018 2019 president of the North American Society for the Sociology of Sport, currently serves as a member of Laureus Sport for Good Research Council in the US, and she is the co-editor of Athletic Experience at Historically Black Colleges and Universities, Past, Present, and Persistence in Critical Race Theory, Black Athletic Experiences in the United States. Thank you so much, Cora. Cora is one of our amazing, amazing interns that we have here um, in our institute. Uh, so you'll meet many more as we go throughout the next two days. So I invite you to connect with them. Uh, they, they're very passionate uh, and they are filled with just a joy for social justice and social work. <laughs> so with that said, I wanna go ahead and get us started. Let's get into this first conversation, Voices of Athlete Activism. This keynote panel is designed to discuss the role of athletes in present day um, athlete activism. The historical legacy of, again, San Jose State's uh, Olympic Project for Human Rights has served as a foundation and a foundational movement of athlete activism. While legendary athlete activism from Muhammad Ali to Tommy Smith and John Carlos to, to, to Colin Kaepernick or Aristina Robinson to Wyoming Atias and Billie Jean King to Gwen Berry, who's joining us today, super excited, um, and Naomi Osaka have maintained a visible presence throughout time. So Dr. Edwards, it is time. That amazing paper provides us great insight and historical context for holistic understanding of the next steps in athlete activism. So with that said, I'll introduce our amazing, amazing lineup that we have with us today. First up is Gwen Berry. Gwen Berry is a world-class athlete who started her hammer throw career in 2008 at the University of Southern Illinois, Carbondale. She gained notoriety in 2016 when she made her first Olympic team and broke the indoor world record in the hammer. Philanthropically, Barry has continued to expand her platform by founding her company, Athlete, I should say Activist Athlete in 2021. Activist Athlete focuses on encouraging athletes to stand up for social justice issues and inequality. Not only does the brand support the message of those athletes, but when they are put, punished for utilizing their voices, Gwen, in collaboration with Color of Change, check them out, helps to financially support athletes so that they can compete in their respective sporting events. Welcome, Gwen. Next, we have Dr. Douglas Hartman. Hartman is a professor of sociology at the University of Minnesota. His research focuses on race, sports, and public culture. He is the author of Midnight Basketball, Race, Sports, and neoliberal social policy. And I must say can also be seen on HBO um, if you can check out a, a little program called Level Playing, Leveling the Playing Field, I believe, correct. Um, a great commentary. I just have to give a quick aside. I was watching the other day and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I know him. So it was an amazing opportunity to say that I actually know somebody that was on that, that television. In addition to Midnight Basketball, he's also authored Race, Culture, and the Revolt of the Black Athlete the 1968 Olympic protests and the aftermath. And he's the co-author of Migration, Incorporation and Change in an Interconnected World. Welcome, Dr. Hartman. And finally, Dr. Yannick Kluck. Yannick serves as the Assistant Professor and Director of Outreach and Inclusive Excellence in the Center of Sport Leadership at Virginia Commonwealth University. His research is focused on utilizing the potential of sport as a vehicle for inclusive leadership and social change, as well as on eliminating barriers to social justice in sport. Specifically, his areas of expertise include cultural studies of sport, athlete activism, sport policy, 
and equity, diversity, and inclusion in the U.S. and global sports. In 2020, he was one of only four U.S. thought leaders appointed to the inaugural Team USA Council on Racial and Social Justice by the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, where he aided a steering committee on athlete protests and demonstrations. This work has led to USOPC to no longer sanction U.S. athletes demonstrating in support of racial and social justice. Welcome. Now, our, third, our fourth member that was supposed to join us today is unable to join, Dr. Leonard Moore. I'm going to give a little bit of his background, um, but he's unable to join. There's currently some, some unrest and some um, school threats in Round Rock, Texas, um, where he lives um, with uh, regards to shooting. So we want to give our thoughts and prayers to him. But I want to definitely take an opportunity to address uh, him, share his bio, as he served as a mentor of mine for many years. Dr. Moore is currently the George Littlefield Professor of American History and former Vice President of Diversity and Community Engagement at the University of Texas, Austin. He's a native of Cleveland, Ohio, who's earned his PhD at Ohio State. Inside the classroom, Dr. Moore teaches more than a thousand undergraduate students in the fall semester in his two classes, History of the Black Power Movement and Race in the Age of Trump. Dr. Moore is also the founder of the Black Student Athlete Summit an annual three-day event that brings together student athletes, coaches, administrators, graduate students, and professors to discuss any and all issues that impact Black student athletes. I have to just give a quick, again, shout out to him and all the efforts that he has done um, with, in creating this particular Black Student Athlete Conference. I was with him when it started out as a Black Student Athlete Symposium um, and talk, just a one-day talk on campus at University of Texas. And it has grown into so much more. And it brought the great opportunity for um, the Institute to sponsor our, our very own uh, San Jose State student athletes and some of its uh, staff to go to that conference to learn more about the, uh, the issues and challenges as it relates to Black athletes um, and ways that we can help uh, empower them, support them, and continue to develop their efforts in their day-to-day. -day. So with that said, uh, super lineup. Again, so excited to have everybody here with us today. I, I just don't know. I mean, we got to get a screenshot of this. I'm telling you <laughs> to get this wonderfulness here. But I want to open it up with uh, a question. Dr. Hartman, um, you know, one of the things, you know, in this past year, um, we've in 2021, right? And it's been a tremendous past 16, 17 months when we talk about COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement. So this past year, I know we see it sort of as written in history. Um, in the work that you do and the examination of society at large, how do you believe we will write this moment um, in history? And how may sports factor into this historical narrative? Uh, thanks for letting me take uh, that question. And, and also I wanna give my thoughts uh, to Dr. Moore, who I think as a historian might have, have even more context to put on this question, but, uh, but we're hoping he's, he and his family are well this morning. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to think about the last year, year and a half of athlete activism um, in a broad context. I think there's no doubt that this moment of activism is a crucial part of the history, not just sports history, American history, history of race relations, of social unrest and social change. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, but that's from a sports scholar and a crowd here that believes that. I think one of the challenges is that it's easy to overlook and misunderstand the broad significance of what's happening in sport and more so how sport is impacting the rest of our society and world with this activism. I want to make a couple really clear, too. I think it's not just the summer of 2020. That was an amazing moment in bubbles. Um, on the fields of play. Athletes were out in the streets. They were doing politics. They were in the media making a sustained push towards uh, movements for justice and change. It's crucial to see that moment, but it's also crucial to put in a bigger perspective. This has been part of a whole decade of activism um, and activism that not only encompasses superstar athletes like Colin Kaepernick and LeBron James, but involves high school students across the country and college student athletes. And perhaps most importantly, in a certain sense, because we often don't talk about it, women athletes 
who've been leaders and innovators in the activism um, that we've seen in the last decade. The WNBA, Megan Rapino, the Williams sisters, Naomi Osaka, these folks have been incredible in their use of the platform. And it's such an honor to be here with Gwen Berry, whose name belongs right at the top of that list. So for me, what's important is not only for me and us to say this history matters and this sports stuff matters in what's happening in our society, but to document that history and to try to better analyze and understand it. And I think that's what we're here to do, to do. not only to call, call it out, but to analyze it and understand these complexities that are so easy to miss when we think about what is it that's happening with our athletes and in our society and how they're being such a social force for change. Thank you so much for sort of laying out the, the context of that history. Uh, I want to take it one step further and stay sort of locked in with, with you in the sense of knowing that, again, you've written extensively on the 68 Olympics, um, whether it be in articles, in your book, again, Race, Culture, and the Revolt of the Black Athlete, uh, the 1968 Olympic protest, and the aftermath. Can you help us recall a little bit about um, and, and situate for us the Olympic Committee for Human Rights, Speed City, then the Olympic Project for Human Rights, and then up to, again, that iconic moment where we see Smith and Carlos in black glove fist atop the podium, standing um, and standing alongside in solidarity, Peter Norman. Could you share a little bit of that? You, you know I want to do that. Uh, I I'm do. So excited <laughs> too, and I, I'm excited to see the statue over your shoulder there on the, on the imagery too. Um, yeah, I, one thing I want to be clear this last decade we've gone through is unprecedented, but the thing that's closest to it is what happened in 1968 with Tommy Smith and John Carlos and Harry Edwards starting at San Jose State. So it's such an opportune and appropriate place and moment for us to be kind of recognizing what's happening now from the campus that you're sitting on, Akilah. So that, that's really important. A couple of things I wanna say about that, maybe to help kind of frame the conversation. Um, one is that a lot of the activism of today quite literally and directly harkens back to the activism of 1968. It draws its inspiration as well as concrete lessons about the power of sport and how to mobilize in and around sport uh, for broader social um, um, impact. Um, it's it, that moment, it, it's um, like, I know we're gonna have Dave Zirin on tomorrow. His book, he, when he interviews all the athletes at different levels of sport who took a knee in the last few years, so many of them, talk about 1968, about Carlos and Smith and Harry Edwards. And, and that's not just kind of idle praise or, or speculate. I mean, that is direct connections. It's about inspiration, motivation, and lessons about how to use sport. A couple of just basic points from 1968 that are important. One is to know that the activism that culminated with Tommy Smith and John Carlos on the Olympic stand in Mexico City wasn't a spontaneous or isolated event. It grew out of a year's worth of protest and organizing. That's where San Jose is such an important part of the story. Tommy Smith taking the class of Harry Edwards and realizing the platform that he had as a world-class Olympic athlete. Uh, and, and then trying to use that power to organize at first a boycott of Black, Olympi Black American Olympians. That didn't completely come together, but it gave rise to a whole other set of activism and protest, not only at San Jose State, but around the country. So that's the first thing. Second thing, and I'm only gonna make a couple points here, but because I know you're gonna have to cut me off otherwise. Second thing is this was not really, even though it's often understood as a protest against sport, that wasn't mainly what they were about. They actually were quite explicit that they thought sport gave them opportunity. This was trying to use the platform of sport to call attention to racial issues in society as a whole, to contribute to the ongoing struggle for black equity and justice. And at the moment when there was these tensions between the civil rights moment and the more black power radicalism, that what Smith and Carlos and Edwards and Lee Evans and all the others who were involved, they weren't, I mean, it wasn't like sports was perfect, but that wasn't their main concern. Their concern was how can we use this platform to contribute to the broader movement and cause? And I think that's really important because an awful lot of the activism we see in society today is a similar kind of orientation. 
it has some attention to inequalities in sport. We're not going to um, sugarcoat those, but really this is an attempt to use sport, to leverage the power of sport, to leverage sports progressive ideals and claims for real social change. The third point that I'll make, and then I'll get out and let some other people jump in, um, is that this was not well received in 1968. This was controversial. Smith and Carlos were treated not as heroes, but as villains. And it's important because in the last few decades, we've rehabilitated them. We've made them into civil rights heroes and icons. We make statues of them that we celebrate on our campuses. But back then, that's not how they were seen, not by the majority, especially the mainstream white majority. They were seen as haters, as traitors, as, as folks who were misusing the platform that they had. I got a lot on that in my book, um, but I think that's really important here, not only historical context, but to really understand how deeply controversial and contested um, that these kind of protests have been in the past, to understand why they're still controversial today. We have to understand not just the drama of the protests, we have to understand the complexity of the reactions and the opposition and resistance and backlash that athlete protest has. That's an important part of this dynamic to embrace, to understand, to figure out how to work within and against. But even more than athletes today, I, I mean, I, I think Smith and Carlos, they really took, took the heat on that, as did Harry Edwards. This, you know, they, they got kicked out of the Olympic Village. They came home not to jobs and opportunities, but to a society that didn't have much place for them. That kind of opposition, um, because we celebrate them now, we forget about that. And it's important to recover that and also to make sense of that for our athletes today, for the opposition that they experience. And what we need to do to not just make powerful statements, but to make real social change. That means engaging this opposition and backlash and not forgetting about it and really hitting it head on. So I, I think that's probably enough, Akilah, to get, get a start, I hope. Uh, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm really anxious notes. to hear I'm, looking, <laughs> I'm taking yeah. notes and looking forward to the exam next week. <laughs> <laughs> it is midterms, by the way. Um, um, it, it, I appreciate your contextualization of all of this, because again, I think like you said, we've made Smith and Carlos these civil rights leaders and heroes. And that's what many of our current generation um, really uh, understands about them. So I appreciate you giving the full context of what was happening in that moment, the backlash that uh, they received, the pains that they endured, the hardships that they endured. And I think for many to understand, to step into this space takes an amazing, an amazing amount of courage. And so with that said, I want to move to a courageous, a courageous woman in front of me, Gwen Berry. One of the things that I want to understand from you is, you know, as an athlete, as a black athlete, as a black female athlete in track and field, my favorite sport, <laughs> in what ways have you been influenced and inspired by Smith and Carlos? I feel like um, my entire life, just being a track and field athlete, I've always been been inspired by Smith and Carlos because um, my father was inspired by them. Um, my father, of course, and I know a, a lot of young black athletes, you know, that's one of the main pictures that you see in a household if you are encouraged by athletics in general. You see, you know, Smith and Carlos and you see Muhammad Ali. So, you know, I did track and field. So, of course, I'm looking at Smith and Carlos. You know, my father so heavily studied um, black history, black American history, um, the black revolution, um, you know, the civil rights era, all of that. So that was something that was always um, grounded into me as a kid. So when I decided to make my statement on the podium, I decided to give respect to them because that's who I always looked up to. And I understood the message, I understood the meaning, and I understood how powerful it was and how iconic that picture was. Thank you. Uh, I mean, again, you, you, you've endured a lot yourself. We'll get into sort of unfolding some more of that um, as well. But as we think about you know, these particular movements and moving through 
um, these time and place. Uh, it, it brings me to want to know a little bit more um, from, from you, Yannick. Uh, you know, I've seen your name come across numerous platforms over the past few years. We just recently um, engaged a lot <laughs> in several different spaces, and it's been great interacting and learning from you and, and um, you know, feeding off the energy um, that you have when you uh, step into these spaces. Uh, and so with that said, you've been advocating for and serving in roles, as I read off the, the laundry list of what you've been doing in your bio, serving in different roles that support the Olympic and Paralympic athletes. So I want to know and maybe share with our audience, what motivated you to step into this space and what has that experience been like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for our great other panelists. Um, honestly, what motivated me was a sense of frustration that it's 2021 and we still have these conversations about social and racial justice, which is, of course, if we know the history of social movements to be expected, but that doesn't, you know, help me get rid of my sense of frustration that it's 2021 and we still have to, you know, justify saying things like Black Lives Matter and treating every human being like they should be treated, giving them a fair shot, giving them access to sport and so on. So that's really what, what motivated me. And I always say that, that I got into the Olympic and Paralympic space for two reasons. One of them, um, very much in line with um, what we talked about for Dr. Uh, Dr. Edwards in terms of just the platform that the Olympics and Paralympics give to talk about things like social injustice, racial injustice, and call attention to the fact in which, you know, athletes competing in those spaces have suffered from systemic injustice. Um, I also very heavily believe that this idea that sport is apolitical and neutral is nonsense. And I'm sure everybody on this panel will, will agree with me. Um, and again, it just goes back to the sense of frustration that even though, you know, this is 50 years ago, we still have to have those conversations, especially with people who look like me, who are white, who, you know, we talk about this current moment as this awakening for, for racial justice. This has been an awakening for white people, and it should be. It should be. Finally, we're getting to a point where people that look like me can have those conversations and are willing to engage. And even now, we're not where we need to be. But, you know, one of the unique moments of this, this specific time is that white people are finally willing in some way to engage um, in these spaces. Um, for me, specifically with my work with the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee, it, it shows that you know, that they are somewhat willing to engage, engage on, on these conversations, even though they have quite a way to go. But the kind of getting at the second piece of why I wanted to be in this space is because, and this is very much inspired by the, the article you referenced, um, Dr. Akila, about um, it is time. And Dr. Edwards talking about, you know, protests are really important. They are really important. But this is also a time where we can move beyond protests to think about how can we create structures and systemic change in the movements um, to create change. And that is really what I view as my calling with um, the Olympic and Paralympic movement and the space I've been to look at the movement and think about what are the policies in place? What are the practices in place? What are the procedures in place that continue to create barriers to progress? Um, thankfully, as part of the Team USA Council on Racial and Social Justice, I get to do that work. I've been getting to do that work for the past year. Um, and what really motivates me is you know, having people like Gwen, who do this work and suffer for doing this work um, and supporting them. I mean, I feel like that's the least I can do in my role as a white scholar, as a white DEI strategist, as a white activist to support people like Gwen, like Raven Saunders, um, like Grayson Bowden, those who have, you know, taken a stand, have taken the heat on those very public, public spaces. So I feel like it's the least I can do on the back end to create the most, you know, inclusive, platform for them to, to do the work and cont continue doing the work for as long as they can. Oh, I just want to sit in this space right now, you know, I mean, because what she shared, again, it's not just, you know, having the education, right? It's not just sort of sharing information. It's an opportunity to also understand we've got to dismantle some of the, the structure when we talk about the policies, the practices, and those particular pieces that have been set in place that don't allow change to happen. So we thank you for the work that you're doing in that space and continue to do in that space, again, to support um, athletes uh, like Gwen. I wanna sort of 
take it to a space and 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 in many ways sort of give a, a foreshadowing into uh, our our another panel that we'll have a conversation that we'll have um, regarding the media uh, tomorrow with our moderator uh, Dr. Sean Fletcher from San Jose State University, and this to 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 Dr. Hartman. When we think of the media, particularly since 1968, it really has positioned athletes, and I think you alluded to it a lot, but it's positioned athletes, particularly black athletes, as the antagonists and not the system, the social circumstance or the policies and practices. Can you talk a little bit about that role, um, that interplay um, between media, athletes and uh, their social justice and social action efforts? I'll at least start. I almost feel like uh, other panelists have had more direct experience with that recently, and I think it has changed a little bit. Um, but I think media is important here, especially because, in my view, where sport and athletes are most powerful is with respect to the voices and platforms that they're provided by the mm -hmm. attention that they receive in society. And so, how, so it, gives, it puts a spotlight on them. So what do you do with that? Do you say things? What do you do? How do you convey that? And that's what the media is about, is how to amplify those protests or those messages or to con con condemn them or critique them. Um, definitely, when you go back to the 60s and 70s um, and well before that, sports media was complicit with the establishment, the athletic establishment and the racial regime in the United States, the, the way that things were. Um, and, and they were like that both because they kind of saw that as fine, but also because they had a view of sports as, as, as uh, um, Dr. Yannick referred to a moment ago, as apolitical. Like it was supposed to be separate from everything else. Um, and, and whether it was kind of better than everything else or just a site of distraction or entertainment, but it wasn't supposed to have social stuff in it. Not all, for sure not protest, but not politics, not social issues. It was just about the games, about the competitions. Um, and so because of that mindset, um, there was a, ver a, a, a deep aversion and hostility to anyone in the athletic arena who was trying to bring broader social issues into the forefront. Um, so that was um, very entrenched, um, has been for many years. I do think, though, in the last few years, it's one of the amazing developments of the last decade, and probably just the last four to six years, is the extent to which sport media has begun to break down at least part of those conventions and report on social issues in and through sports, to take the lives and concerns of athletes off the fields of play with some seriousness. They don't always agree with it. They're not always endorsing it, but that's become much more part of the state of, of what um, journalists think they're supposed, sports journalists think they're supposed to do. Um, and that's on issues of race. It's on issues of gender equity of social, uh, of, of, se uh, uh, of sexual rights and freedoms. It's about mental health. But this is a tremendous shift that's happened in the last few years, at least being kind of open and willing to report on those issues. That I think it's given space for athletes to have their voices out there that did not exist a decade ago and definitely not before that. So that's, that's why I think it's important to have a historical context about the, not only importance of media, but its antagonistic role until quite recently. Now, I still do think there's a lot of conservative forces and factors and actors in the media, but that's a big shift that's happened recently um, that, that allows reporting um, a, a, to, to be um, far more uh, attentive to social issues. Now, one other thing I'll say, I think the media Another thing that's really emerged separate from sport is just the polarization of the media. So that's another thing that's really important and challenging here is that you're gonna have then attention to social issues of sport, but the, the media can amplify pol and polarize as well as promote and support or condemn it. So that's where sport kind of gets bound up with a whole set of things happening in our society that's about political polarization, about partisanship, and about the kind of divides in our country that sport kind of is part of and reflects, um, but also often wants to try to um, ignore, much less overcome. So hopefully that's a little bit, but I think it's the centrality of the media is crucial here because that's what we depend on. Uh, for getting the messages, the broader context, the deeper connections into the conversation. 
Thank you. Yeah, the this role of the media has been evolving, I think. And um, even to sort of to call back to uh, Dr. Edwards' book, The Revolt of the Black Athlete, there's a key chapter in there where he talks about the relationship of the Black athlete with the media, mainstream media, white reporters, Black reporters, um, and that, that sort of conversation. Um, and I know my students that I teach this semester um, in my course in the Department of African American Studies on uh, race, sport, activism, and social movements. They're learning about this history and this interplay. Um, many of them are student athletes, so a shout out to them as well, but learning how they can begin to use their platform for that. And I know we'll have some great um, uh, a workshop that will we'll share more about those efforts. Keeping in line with the media, uh, Gwen, I want to kind of want to want to go to you and 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 understand you've been in the media. Seeing yourself, <laughs> I mean, just in and out and just you know, oh. off and on and you know, but seeing yourself as the center of these stories, do you pay attention to the criticism? Does it misrepresent you, or does it add purpose to your activist efforts? I think it does a little bit of both. I think, um, like Doug was mentioning, media is so different these days. Um, it's a revolution, right? Because social media is so heavily dependent on. Like, literally everybody has some type of social media site. Everybody looks at some type of social media site every single day. So for me, the fact that because you are a professional athlete or because you have this platform with these hundreds of thousands of followers, it's, it's, it's crazy to believe that people want to know so much about your life. They demand to know everything, what you eat, what are you doing? What are your workouts? Who are you dating? Who are you, you know, who did you get divorced to? Who did you fight? But they don't want to know how you feel about certain aspects of your life that traumatize you that hold you back, that don't represent you. So it's kind of a contradiction of what people want. And it, it really plays out in political media more than anything, because the media loves to see all of these things. And a politician would love for you to say, hey, tell these people to vote for me. But then again, they don't want you to say, well, I think they need to put more you know, money into these black communities. So for me, it's a little bit of both. I am 100% always, you know, misconstrued. People do not understand me. People do not know me. But for those who do, I feel like it does help um, me spread my message and just plant the seed to say, I am who I am. But if you're going to look at my media and you're going to look at me, you're going to always know what I represent, who I represent, and what I stand for, regardless if you want to accept it or not. I am here to make you uncomfortable. I am here to make you listen to my message. You can know a little bit about my life, but you will always know what I stand for. And I feel like that is so important for every athlete because some people cannot relate to Fox News or to CNN. These kids are watching these athletes because they can relate to us. They understand us. They feel like they do what, what we do. They want to live our lives. So it's important that we, we give these messages and we use the media to our advantage, whether we're hated or not, because everyone is looking at us. Can we just give a hand clap for that? I need to see the <laughs> chat blow up, a hand clap, virtual claps, um, you know, send flowers and love. All of what you're saying and sharing are things that I think we as even scholars on this panel um, can, can understand, not fully because we're not in your shoes, but in a lot of the aftermath, and as you said, the trauma of all of that, we are communicating with those athletes. We are comforting them. Families are nurturing them in these spaces. And when we talk about sort of the, the mental health um, stress that places on an individual, it's much. Because at the same time, we also understand you're, you're accomplishing feats that many will never even uh, get to. When we talk about the Olympic Games, the competition the, the uh, efforts that you put into training. Um, I'm thinking and, and recalling on, and I have to just have a moment to settle in on Simone Biles' experience of the Olympics. The individuals that called her out, it was one, it just, it, it, it broke me down. I cried because to not understand what it took to get to that platform, to not understand the, the level of physicality. Listen, I'm, I've got my cartwheel down, but to do what she does, <laughs> 
on a platform that is that narrow at that level, be the face of the games, be the leader of a team, is a lot to experience at such a young age too. So we have to always sort of keep that in mind and keep in mind their humanity in these respects. So again, I give all props to you as an athlete, but more importantly, just as a human being that is living your truth, using your platform, and definitely influencing and empowering the young people that you interact with. So I say thank you. Had to have that moment. <laughs> um, taking that and, 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 and moving from that, it's, it's tough too. But I want to thank uh, Yannick from that. You know, you shared a little bit of the fact of, um, you know, working with the OPC, but I want you to, to kind of move in a little bit more about what it means to sort of work with athletes work with athletes to write and bring forth legislation, rewrite and amend the policies when we talk about Rule 50. How did that come about as far as sitting in those spaces and being able to be alongside with those individuals um, and working at that, I would say, level of sport and organizational efforts? Yeah, absolutely. That's actually a great transition because these two things are not um, unrelated. We we do this work because we want to center the athletes, especially those who have been pushed to the margins historically. Um, so a lot of the work, and I have to distinguish here between some of the work I'm doing with the US OPC and some then some of my advocacy and activism on the side on <laughs> IOC Rule 50. So I'll start with the the um, US OPC piece. So with that, when that council was formed about a year and a half ago, they were pretty intentional about making sure that that council is run by athletes. And that was important to me too, that it's not just a bunch of academics, you know, drawing from our ideas, telling them what to do. It's about centering the athlete voice, especially those athletes from historically minoritized populations um, and making sure that they are in the driver's seat and they tell us, how do we change? How do we need to change the movement? So you feel protected, you feel valued, you feel like you belong in this movement. Um, that is, no matter if I do work with the USOPC, with the NCAA, with high schools, that's how I approach my work. I want the athletes to be in the driver's seat and I want them to feel like they have control as to how we create environments that nurture a sense of belonging or value. Um, and those two can sometimes be, be separate things. Um, but that's the one piece that I think what has made some of that work so successful is that we have been very strategic about centering those voices and Gwen is, is one of them. Um, any milestone we have with their council, we draw in Gwen and say, hey, this is what happened. This is what's going to come out. Um, you know, that is one way um, for us to do that. Of course, one of the most public things coming out of the, the US OPC council is um, our discussion on IOC Rule 50 or Section 2.2 and the um, Paralympic counterpart, which both of those rules, those are the rules that say you can't protest during the Olympic or Paralympic Games. Um, very simplified, but that's pretty much what it comes down to. Um, and some of the work we did with the USOPC is, you know, look at the rule. First of all, look at the rule and see how it is racially charged. There is clear racially charged racist language in the rule. Um, so that became one of the foundational aspects of our argument to say that you can you can take away that right of athletes to speak up on issues because sport has never been, as we talked about, a neutral place in the first in the in the first place. Um, so again, we want to make sure we center the athletes in those conversations. And part of that has been challenging, um, right? Because centering the athletes means giving up some of the control of the powers that be in the Olympic and Paralympic movement. And we've had meetings where we had um, you know, people who 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 lead in the movement say, you know, I feel like I'm I'm losing a bit of control here. And that's when we come in and say, good, good. It means that we are doing our job because for us to be successful, there has to be a shift of, of power relations. There has to be a sense of, of loss of control of those in power because it means that we are shifting the power to the athletes. Um, so that is the one piece that that I always, I always highlight. Um, the other piece is just thinking about how can we support that athlete voice. So how can we strategically build coalitions that elevate athlete voices? Um, again, the Rule 50 Section 2.2 work is, is kind of the most visible, but we are doing a lot of work on the back end thinking about institutional awareness, cultural change. What can we do within the USOPC, within the broader Olympic and Paralympic movement to get more athlete representation on any decision-making committee, 
to get input from those from minoritized groups, black athletes, racially minoritized athletes, LGBTQ athletes, athletes with disabilities. How can we give them more of a prominent voice in the movement? And that's where the real work starts, you know, to change those structures, those policies, those practices to center those voices. Um, the last thing I'll say, this is outside of my work with the USOPC, but um, Akila, you know this, over the summer, me and uh, my colleague Eli Wolf was gonna be on another panel, um, worked on an open letter to the US, to the IOC and the IPC that we launched the night before the opening ceremony of the Tokyo Olympic Games, um, calling on the IOC and IPC not to sanction athletes. In terms of expectation settings, we knew that the letter wasn't probably gonna do much, but it was about forming a collective voice. Within a week, we got about 150 athletes, um, change makers, community organizers, scholars to sign the letter. Gwen was one of them. Akila, you were one of them. Um, Doc, actually, I'm not sure we probably included you too. I, I have to look at the list. Um, but, you know, it was a pretty, pretty quick effort and turnaround. And we knew that, you know, the people at the IOC and IPC, they're not going to see the letter and say, thank you, change makers, for letting us know we will disregard Rule 50. That wasn't going to happen, but it is about getting the voice out there and showing that this, this movement is gaining momentum, especially as we head into the Beijing games, where those issues will be even more prominent. Um, so I hope that got at your question. I got, got off on a, on a little tangent, but yeah, it's about no. collective voice. That's, that's the piece here. <laughs> well, and I, I want to, uh, you know, Doug, Gwen, to even chime in this notion of, um, this notion of collectivism, you know, collectivism versus working as an individual and the power of that. Because I think one of the things that, you know, we understand, yes, this, this panel, um, it represents a, a bit of diversity in the sense that we have to understand this is not just a U.S. issue that's taking place. This is something that's happening on a global stage. And I want to really sort of keep that in conversation. And if anything, again, I think even for we at the Institute, we have been connecting with people all across the world, um, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, uh, the West Indies, um, you know, London, England when we as well. And it's been a quite phenomenal conversation and a, a great opportunity to come together with like-minded like individuals and thought leaders to, to build up at every level. So if you all each want to chime in a little bit more and sort of share about the importance of, you know, the power in the collective, uh, of having a collective group come together, uh, and then perhaps we'll shift to a little bit to the power of one. Um, on, on either end, but help us sort of understand what that means and the mindset. I would say of this, I want to I want to glean off of, of Yannick for this the second part uh, is also to understand a little bit of the mindset that you think coaches, administrative leaders, and even athletes might must have for effective change. You know, where do you you sit in your perspective or perhaps directives, uh, calls to action, if you will for those in positions of power, as you said, Yannick, that were a little uncomfortable that they were relinquishing some of that. Maybe have you start us off with that question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I definitely want to give, give credit to the leaders in, in the movement too, in the um, United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee who have been open. That's the first step to just be open to do the work. If you don't have a leader that's open to that, it's very hard to get change. And that's one of the you know ways that this movement is different. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So I, I always share the story that, you know, when I, and this is across the board, if I do um, work with high school ADs, athletes, all the way up to the, you know, elite athletic level, is that there was always some folks, and again, I don't want to generalize, but it's usually people who look like me, who are white, and have a lot of privilege, who say, you know, Yannick, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for talking to us. I love this, you know, DI, social justice, that's your agenda. I love it. But honestly, it's, that's not in my job description. That is not part of my, mm. my role in the organization. And every time I have to tell them that that is the issue, that thinking is the issue, that if you work with human beings, which in sport, 99.9% .9 of the people <laughs> do, then DEI and thinking about barriers to social and racial justice is part of your job, whether that's in your job description or not. There's no such thing as not engaging on these, these issues. If you are not engaging on these issues, you're making them worse. Um, and I think that's where, where the collective comes in, kind of showing people, especially those in power, that this is your responsibility, especially if you're white, especially if you have privileged identities. Um, there is no option to just, just be silent and not engage. If you're not engaging, you're making it worse. And I think that's where this power of the collective, com collective comes in, that the more 
hearts and minds, we change towards people feeling enraged, feeling frustrated, feeling like something needs to change. That's where we can truly push for change. So I definitely want to start with saying that, that I think the power in that collective is to change those minds that regardless of, you know, whether it's in your job description or not, this is part of your work. If you're working with people, this is part of your work, especially if you have more privileged identities. And the other thing while yeah. I'm at it, um, yeah. <laughs> the other thing that, that I always get to in, in, in this work is that especially those in power, they're always really focused on this idea of unity. And unity is important, especially across the mo movement. But this whole discourse surrounding unity can actually work to further, further disenfranchise those on the margins. So mm -hmm. I always have people say that, you know, in our organization, we have people who, you know, might disagree with your anti-racist work. How do we include them in the movement? And then I have to be the one saying, well, if you have people who disagree with anti-racist work, then they are racist. They are likely white supremacists and they do not have to even they cannot have an ounce of feeling like they belong in this movement or this work won't be successful so kind of shifting that thinking that you know doing racial and social justice work means that we cannot include folks who do not believe in this work we cannot include white supremacists we cannot include racists we cannot include homophobes um, if they believe you know if those are their ideals they will eradicate our work eventually so that's the other piece that i always highlight that we can include those voices they those clues voices cannot feel like they have a space um, in this movement and this seems really harsh but that's unfortunately the truth thank you thank you gwen doug thoughts sorry. on that notion of the collective <laughs> yeah sorry. sorry but um I, I would just say one of the reasons why I decided in my demonstration to hold up the Black Fist is because I was mentored by Dr. John Carlos um, over the season um, when after I did, you know, protest in 2019. And he told me um, an interesting story about why they chose to raise the Black Fist. And it was because of unity. You know, he said, if you look at your hand, he said the individual fingers are weak. They really can't do anything but press. But he said, and you put those hands together, it makes a fist and the fist is strong and the fist can punch through anything. So there's a reason why true unity and solidarity is so important. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why as far as athletes, um, athletes like myself are so heavily persecuted by the media because they do, they do not want other athletes to do what I do. So they're going to punish me as, as worse as they can so that they scare other athletes or other influencers to say, don't be this girl, she lost it all. Do you want your contract? You know, do you want your scholarship? If you want those things, then you can't be like her. You can't, you know, speak out on issues that we don't want to hear about. So I feel like those people of power, because they are so afraid to give up that power, to share the power, or to even have a different type of mindset as to why athletes or discriminated people are saying these things, um, they really, really heavy, heavily, um, you know, rely on punishment and it's, you know, it's horrible. Like, it, like I've said a thousand times, I lost 80% of my income, 80%. And I was only one athlete, Colin Kaepernick kicked out the league, you know, Dr. Uh, John Smith, Dr. Carlos, they were kicked out the Olympic games. So punishment is a way of fear. And these people in power usually don't have anybody holding them accountable so they can do what they want. Great points. So, yeah. Great points on all levels. Go ahead, Doc. No. I was just going to, so, you know, I'm not an athlete. I'm not really an activist. I'm an analyst. And to me, I just want to underscore the points that people are making here about how organizing happens and the challenges that it faces against, you know, establishments that are opposed. Um, I guess there's two things I'll also signal. I, one of the challenges in sport organizing, I think, is that you need all this collective support, mm -hmm. but it often turns out to be individual athletes, especially in, in individual sports, because of their prominence that have to be the spokespeople, the leaders, which both gives them prominence and makes them the butt, the, the, the target of opposition. Um, so there's a, but there, the big thing there is there's a real complicated dynamic or tension between individuals and collectives in this organizing. And, and I think um, that's important to know. And here's the other thing I wanna say, especially coming out off of what 
Dr. Yannick said, but then thinking about how Gwen was framing this, I actually think one of the things that's happening in our sports institutions right now is that we, you know, sports is, has these tremendously aspirational ideals about contributing to racial justice, about being in service of human rights, about equity and justice broadly. And what I fear is happening in some ways is we're almost requiring individual athletes to be the conscience, to be the carriers of our highest ideals. So in a sense, we're getting out of the way a little more as establishment um, and, and allowing more voices and protests to happen. But it also is putting even more onus on individual athletes to carry through the high ideals that many of us aspire to in and through sport. And so that's why I wanna underscore Gwen's experience and the work that Dr. Yannick's doing is how to support that because it's making it even more on the backs of individual athletes, um, even when there's a movement behind them um, because they are the carriers. They're the embodiment of the great ideals that many of us believe in or got started with in sport, even though we know it's hard to live up to those, but we still aspire to them. And it's athlete voices that, that are the ones who are carrying that consciousness and trying to help us make good on those ideals. Thank you, Doug. And I, I, wanna, I wanna stay with you on that because, um, and I'm reading a, a comment by Tiana. She's like, analyst, activist, athlete, we need everybody, which is true. <laughs> we need everybody. Continuing in that analyst main, uh, main frame, um, our mindset, I should say, history has allowed us to analyze the fullness of social movements, inclusive of demonstrations like sit-ins, protests, boycotts, filled with demands that may or may not have been met. Of these movements, inclusive of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, can you share with us, Doug, um, what methods prove most effective? Well, you know, this is a question about outcomes and impacts. And, and it requires us to go beyond just the moment of protest, just the expression of discontent and think about what comes out of that. Oftentimes, I think we try, we, we end up thinking about that in really materialistic institutional terms, like what reforms happen or what concrete change happened. And I think that uh, that's important, um, especially in the world of sport, in our institutions that we push for change, that we see reform. But I think it also can serve to miss where sport is most powerful um, in society. And, and there, I think I'll use some words, hopefully that it's sports power is symbolic. It's communicative. It's about confronting ideas, ideas about justice, ideas about inequality and forcing people who might not otherwise understand or care about those issues to pay attention to them. I go back to what Gwen said, her job's not, she said, it's not to make people agree with her, it's to make her, them uncomfortable. And that's because she's trying to, one, bring issues that they don't want to think about, and two, bring perspectives that they might not agree with. You're not necessarily going to change their minds, but you're trying, I think, Gwen, I hope this is fair, to get attention to those issues that are otherwise forgotten and, and, and ignored. And maybe so I don't go too long on this, I'll say to me, that's what the genius of Tommy Smith and John Carlos, along with Peter Norman on the victory stand in, in Mexico City was all about. They didn't actually say anything. They didn't tell anybody to do anything. They didn't ask people to agree with them. They just put their bodies on the stand and using rituals and gestures to say, blackness in America is a problem. Racial injustice exists. And they didn't, that's all they did. They took tremendous heat for that. They got, you know, all kinds of things happened in their lives and the lives of those who supported them. But my point is what that moment is so powerful about is sport as an arena to highlight issues, to send messages, to force difficult conversations. Um, and so that's, I think, the, the first part of my answer um, Dr. Akila, um, the fullness of these movements and what they can accomplish, it's recognizing that the power that sport has to put issues and agendas, at least in the public domain, in the public conversation. Um, it could do other things too. We could talk about some of those things. I, I'm happy to, but I think kind of to realize this is important because I think so often we sell short the importance of symbolism 
and of conversations and of ideals of justice and realities of, anti- of, of, of racism, that just that talk and attention is crucial and a huge part of the power and success of athletes and athletics. Ooh, I hope everybody out there is taking notes, <laughs> is taking notes in that respect. Gwen, did you want to follow up in any way with regards to uh, what Doug has shared with regards to um, those, those efforts and methods? Especially if I put I words can... in your mouth, Gwen. I did not. I was, I was kind of projecting some and maybe more than I should have. Yeah, oh, I, no, I no, sense, no, it, you forward. were right. You were right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think that um, we all know that protest has been effective, if anything, in just planting the seed, as Doug Doug just mentioned, but I do think um, just because of the bravery that I see in this new generation and um, the, the, the impact of social media, again, media, 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 I think that um, we should be willing to go above the bar a little bit more. Um, I feel like athletes don't know their power enough to know that if we stop, everything would change immediately, just like COVID. So I feel like once athletes know their power and once they really, truly, truly want to sacrifice what they can afford to sacrifice, I think that's when we'll really get um, results that we're looking for. I feel like, you know, COVID, COVID was, you know, essential. You know, it was necessary. It did really, you know, highlight all the issues in America and in the world that have been swept under the rug. But I also think it highlighted the importance of entertainment and the importance of sport. So I do feel like in that regard, my, my, my biggest dream is like for all athletes, just for one year, just like COVID, to not play any sports, to not engage in any sports. Because I feel like that in itself would make a statement. Protest is fine. You know, using your social media platform is fine. But direct action and, you know, dramatic, radical action, I think that changes things more than just words and messages, in my opinion. I feel like if we're more dramatic, if we're more radical, um, these issues will be really, really heavily thought about. Um, And then we'll, you know, we'll see change. Because of, you know, COVID, you, you know, the George Floyd situation, um, the Breonna Taylor situation, I feel like the media did, you know, because they had to, because of the athletes, you know, they had to highlight some of the, you know, some of the issues during the games and they highlighted what some of the players were doing. I don't know if anybody noticed that, like the players made, um, especially in the NBA, the players kind of made the media highlight these issues. But now that basketball has started back, you don't hear any of it. Now it's just, oh, basketball, he did this or he shot this three. You don't hear any of the racial and social injustice issues being highlighted anymore. Same with the NFL. So I feel like, and same with the WNBA. Somebody said, don't forget the WNBA. So I feel like, you know, now that the world is getting back to normal or everybody is outside now, people are forgetting again. So what do we need to do so people won't forget? You know, it has to be more radical and dramatic, in my opinion, and... Yeah, I think that's when we'll see change for sure. Okay. Thank you for those comments, because I think you lead us right into, um, you know, again, some of the work that uh, Yannicka has been a part of, in particular with the Muhammad Ali Center. So this past summer, we had the great opportunity, I say it's a great opportunity to join in collaboration in a collectivist space um, with a number of panel- panelists that are actually on this conference today. Uh, Eli Wolf, Mary Humms, again, directing and their leadership in that as well as uh, Anna Johannes, uh, Dr. Joseph Cooper, Joanne Pasternak, Anthony Weems, and yes, Gwen Berry uh, made that appearance. Um, and, and, and Dr. Richard Lapchick also gave stories to help us understand the significance and the importance of working together as a collective. So again, calling back on the, the Olympic project and other amazing movements and, and really historical movements that have happened, what is unique about the current movement of activism? And what is the significance of a collective and inclusive and diverse forum like the Muhammad Ali Center's Athlete and Social Change Forum? Yeah, I think um, this is a good follow up to what we just discussed because the, the theme of the forum was, I believe athletes are the political power of athletes. So one of the key questions we debated with the group was, how can we move beyond the symbolic power of athletes to 
drive political and social change. Um, and I think, you know, somebody in the chat mentioned the WNBA. I think what the WNBA did during the last election cycle was very indicative of this current wave of activism, you know, grassroots organizing, changing outcomes in political um, elections, changing policies, changing ownership um, makeup, demographic makeup in, in teams in the WNBA. I think it's very expressive of the, the current wave we're in where um, the symbolic piece is very important, very important. But we're also thinking about how can we look at the structures in place and change, you know, when we all know in social movements, there is highs and lows, like um, Gwen said, right now we're losing a lot of momentum. You know, people like us who do this work are like, we saw the great statements, the Black Lives Matter statements from all these organizations a year and a half ago. What's the action that's following, right? Um, that's why it's important for people like us to hold, hold these organizations accountable. And we can already feel that momentum going away. So that Muhammad Ali Center Forum was really about thinking, how can we create the structure, the policies, the political outcomes to make sure we can sustain this momentum as long as we can and actually change um, the very structure that creates these, these inequitable experiences. Um, so that was one of the key, the key questions. The other piece, and this is really coming from, from some of the work I'm doing with um, my friends and colleagues, Shannon Jolly at Georgia and um, Dr. Joseph Cooper at UMass Boston, who's getting one shout out after the other here, but he should, because his work is amazing. Um, and we are really looking at, you know, what we call institutional activism. So moving beyond these individual acts of activism towards changing the very institutions that govern US sport, but also global sport. That's really at the heart of my work with Rule 50 and Section 2.2. So thinking about how can we give athletes, and not just athletes, but administrators from minoritized populations, how can we give them institutional power to change those institutions towards centering marginalized voices? Um, that's really, I think, what's unique about this current movement, that we have more of, of those conversations, thinking about the symbolic is really important, but how can we move beyond that to, as Gwen said, create radical change in sport and an extension in society? Okay, I was, I was gonna no, say- No, please, I was, uh, I was taking a breath. I'm thinking here, <laughs> that's really important, Yannick. One is the institutional change. I think it's important to push for institutional change in sport, not only to bring about a better and more just sport world, but because how sport then can be a model for others in society to aspire to. And that, that to me, one of the great examples of that's Title IX, which wasn't an athletic thing originally, it was public policy, but it became prominent and attended to. And like dads started to care about it when they started to care about access to sport for their girls. And, and I think that's important then not only in the sports world that it created equity and access that didn't exist, but how it became a model in other aspects of society and in other people ways people think about their lives. And then the other thing I wanna highlight is the first part you were talking about, because um, in terms of when athletic protest is successful, I think it's important not to expect too much just of athletes and even athlete organizations. I think when sport protest has been most successful in concrete change, it's been in coalition and connection with other movements, with other organizations, with other agencies. And like two examples of that to me in the current era would be like when the Missouri Tigers football team did their um, threaten to boycott of a, of a game in 2015 that eventually led to all kinds of fallout, including the president of that university losing his job. That wasn't just the football players that did that. They were connecting with a huge amount of activism that black students on campus had been engaged with for months and months. And, and, and I think that's important to, that athletes don't have to do everything, but they do have to think about how they're connected with others. And the other example I give is the WNBA one, and in particular, the Atlanta um, team, the dream, and the ways that they um, worked with Stacey Abrams and the Democratic Party to do grassroots organizing and mobilizing around the Warnick campaign. I think we still don't really understand exactly how that happened. And, and to say that athletes, exactly what role those women played, but we know it was a big one. 
And we know it wouldn't have happened with all the grassroots organizing and mobilizing that was already happening because of Abrams and all the feet on the ground in Georgia um, that athletes helped to amplify and call attention to. But they couldn't have done that on their own. They, they, and we shouldn't expect athletes to do all that. So, so that's I think both of those are kind of underlying some of the points that you made before. But it's important to see all that context. Um, because especially if we're concerned not only about sport, but about how sport can help us make change in society, it's all those kind of connections and symbolic um, and, and the way that sport is symbolic and communicative that really starts to, I think, settle where the power of, of athletics is. I think that's a, a great lead in, Doug. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, my next question is for Gwen. Uh, but before we get into the question, I want to invite all of those in our audience. If you have questions for our panelists, please send them forward. We're going to get into that and, um, and sh very shortly. So with that lead in by Doug, I, I want to talk with you, Gwen, a little bit about, you know, what are next steps for you um, for your athlete activist journey? Um, and in particular, if you could talk with us a little bit um, about your collaboration with Color of Change how it's amplified efforts, you know, what do they stand for and how it's even again to uh, uh, allowed you to amplify and utilize your voice more. Um, so I'll start with um, working with Color of Change. It's, it's undescribable. Color of Change reached out to me after um, my battle with the USOPC, uh, USA Track and Field and IOC in regards to um, my punishment and um, me getting an apology for, you know, honestly being punished for something that the world, you know, woke up and understood was really crazy, you know, a couple of months afterwards. So they reached out to me and um, their biggest thing was one, to help not only help me financially to stay in the sport because they felt like my presence in the sport and me making it to the Olympic games would be very impactful for not only people that look like me in the sport, but also, you know, the world. Um, they also helped me amplify what I was saying, um, you know, and what, what that meant, you know, my purpose or my vision or, you know, just me being able to say these things are not right because I know for sure that the majority of the athletes going to the Olympic Games are Black athletes who come from absolutely nothing. And the fact that we cannot say anything, speak out on anything about the communities that we come from um, is 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 wrong. So they really have been um, like, you know, at the forefront of me being able to share my platform, share my story, speak out about these issues. And I actually just did a, um, an op-ed with them in the Player Tribune today, earlier this morning, I, I released an article, you know, just about my personal experience heading into the Olympic game. So yeah, Color Change has been phenomenal. Um, I don't know if anybody knows, but the founder is um, Van Jones. He's actually a politician and it's run by um, a man named uh, Rashad. And he's he's amazing too, Rashad Richardson. He's um, a politician as well and a freedom fighter. So, you know, I'm connected with a lot, a lot of um, people that are trying to change policies and legislation. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm honored to be um, an advocate and an athlete for them. As far as what I'm doing now, um, I'm currently in grad school. Um, I am studying public health with the emphasis of cultural competency. And I am doing like policy formation and stuff like that so I can understand what is going on in this world and how I can be effective to not only my community, but also um, discriminating minorities in America. Because I feel like in order to serve somebody, you do need to know what they need. Um, and so I'm doing that, I'm studying that. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to change some policies, trying to, you know, knock down some doors and legislation and uh, continue making people uncomfortable. Continue to make people uncomfortable. Love it. <laughs> I wanted to move into a question uh, for our, our panelists, in particular for Gwen, um, from our audience. Um, Shantae asked, how do you self-protect with such a prominent place in this movement with so much visibility and direct criticism? And are there any ideas for self-preservation or recovery for athletes um, that are interested in using their platform more out from, outwardly as activists? And she's saying uh, in, in her uh, question here, thinking of athletes that want um, to sustain this, that maybe they've already gotten over their first fear of risk, but are more 
um, in the vein of burned out or exhausted. So again, how do you self-protect and uh, what information or advice can you give for self-preservation? Yeah, I feel like that's a very important question because, you know, as human beings, emotionally, we, you know, it's, we get exhausted um, and it shows. I feel like one of the things that really hurt me at the Olympic Games was the fact that I was exhausted, especially in the final at the Olympic Games. So for me, what I try to do is I always try to rely on, you know, my group of peers, my group of mentors that really, you know, keep me grounded in my thought, in my fears, or in my anxiety when it comes to putting myself out there or speaking on my story or being vulnerable with the world as to why I care about the issues that I speak about. I think that's extremely important is having a, a strong group of people surrounding you with positivity and love because the world can definitely be a cruel place. Um, I also heavily rely on um, experiences. So I always try to experience beautiful things, you know, nature, walks, um, you know, going to someplace I've never been before, vacationing, um, just surrounding myself with nature, beauty, um, and just, you know, I really don't, I'm really not on social media a lot. I know people probably noticed that because social media is so crazy to me. It really gives me anxiety. Um, so I try to stay off of social media a lot. And if I can, I do, you know, support everybody that I can. And then I switch off because I feel like for me, that helps my mental. Um, yeah, and I give myself to the world a lot. So I just try to keep something for myself. So staying off social media helps me. Um, and yeah, I feel like you just have to find something to give you peace. Um, and it just depends on what type of person you are and what you like to do. Thank you. I'm, I'm there with you on the social media. It takes me forever to, to just send a tweet. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long day. Being a writer, you get so concerned about all of those things. But again, self-protection, the nature, I truly appreciate. Again, being in California now, being able to go to the beach, um, hang out with my children are ways that um, I utilize to sort of unplug and self-preserve um, as well. We've got a couple more questions in the Q&A that I want to share with our panelists. One of our attendees, Dell, asked, could you please share um, or speak about Kurt Flood of the St. Louis Cardinals baseball team, losing his career over free agency and suing uh, baseball? Um, he cannot get into the Hall of Fame. And before our panelists uh, you know, speak to that, uh, I, I will just be happy to say I did share um, a little bit of the life and lived experiences of Kurt Flood again with my students, and some of them are on the, the webinar today out of uh, Dave Zirin's book, What's My Name, Fool. So again, another, another text to pick up to read more about that um, and giving a, a quick shout out to uh, our, one of our panelists tomorrow, Dr. Hartman. Yeah, I, I don't have all of history at my, at my fingertips here, but um, I, one thing I'd say about Kurt Flood, kind of even back, stepping back from the question is, how his um, you know, radical acts in service of uniz unionization and the collectivity of athletes. I think that was largely inspired by what Tommy Smith and John Carlos and Harry Edwards and all were doing in the Olympic context. Um, I think you, you know, when you think about the 60s, it's easy to focus on one or two moments, but it was a broader kind of set of concerns in the air among um, especially black athletes pushing for equity and justice in their in their particular realms. And so that movement for unions that, um, you know, that got really brought on by the, you know, the claim to free agency from flood was is huge, a huge part of that. There's a um, Professor Khan, I think at Penn State has a book on that, um, that I think is very good uh, to really understand that history. I, I think it's tricky with Hall of Fame claims with with flood. Partly because I think it, his career was so truncated because of that stand that it's easy to overlook um, or, or to kind of not understand him as a Hall of Fame member. To me, if you'd be if you want to push for that, I think it requires us to start to create standards of athletic excellence that aren't only about performance on the fields of play, but are also about social vision about consciousness, about contribution to a greater good. Um, and I guess that would be my radical vision. Um, um, it wouldn't just be about flood, but it's about rethinking what Hall of Fames are meant to establish 
uh, and, and, and memorialize. Um, and not just about mere or sheer athletic brilliance, but about athletic brilliance combined with um, broader social consciousness uh, and efforts towards social change. It's, it's different than we usually think because um, we love to focus so much just on the performance. Um, but I think it expands out in ways that we might not predict. And then one other thing, even the Hall of Fames, they always have these kind of character references. They act like they want athletes to be role models, but it's a very personalized thing, a very kind of middle-class kind of version. I guess what I'm saying is we could have a, more, a, a, a more radical, more broad vision of what we mean by role model and hero um, that, that goes beyond not only athletic performance and personal characteristics, but broader social issues. Thank you so much. We're getting close to the end of our program and I wanna kind of roll in some of our Q&A questions uh, along with also some, some final statements um, and closing comments. So um, we, we have a question with regards to sort of holding the media accountable, um, but I actually want to, before we kind of go into that final takeaways, because I think that question can be wrapped up in there, but I think a very important question, particularly with the number of, of athletes that we have participating in this event with us, I want to know from from each and every one of you. I'm, I'm actually giving a, a, a looking at looking at Gwen in many ways as well. Um, but how important is it to be good? How important is it to be a leader on a team? How important is it to have a certain level of accomplishment to an athlete activist effort? I consider and want us to consider Smith and Carlos, CP3, Maya Moore in that same way. And at the same time, how is important because you told us you're going back to school, right? <laughs> But at the same time, how important is it to be educated, informed, and astute of history and present day issues and inequities? And I know it's a loaded question, um, but I want you to sort of settle in that. Again, how important is it to be good to have that platform? How important is it to be educated? And to round that into sort of some closing comments of you know, providing some advice or actionable steps to athletes, to coaches, to parents, administrators, sponsors, and endorse athletes, and even the media when interfacing with, with athletes stepping into these activist space. So I know I've given a loaded question, um, but I, I want to sort of think about those in closing statements from each and every one of you as we close out this segment of uh, our opening keynote conversation. And I'll start with, who wants to raise a hand? Who wants to jump into that? Yannick, I'm seeing you itching. <laughs> Some closing comments. Okay, it is time. Fun. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, absolutely. Um, I'll leave the the question of whether or not you have to be good to uh, the other other panelists. Um, I will focus on the education piece. So um, me and Dr. Jasmine and Dr. Joey are going to do a session later on athlete activism. And one of the things we are stressing there is that you have to know what you're talking about to you know to really leverage your platform. So education, I think, is really important, which is one of the reasons that activism is so exhausting because that work never ends. As systems, societies evolve, there's new knowledge to be gained and you have to be you know, an expert in some way, shape or form in, in your field. And that expertise can come from lived experience. It doesn't mean that you have to have a PhD in you know, social justice work. That can come from personal experience, but you have to be knowledgeable, you have to be educated about the things that you're passionate about. So I think that's really, really important. Um, in terms of closing comments, so I was going to leave folks with um, three pieces of advice, I think, if they want to engage in activism. The one we kind of covered already, and that's to prioritize self-care, which Gwen so, spoke so powerfully about. Um, self-care is not something that you should think about when you just when you're struggling. That should always be your priority. You always have to prioritize your health, mental, physical, psychological, spiritual. Um, you can only do your best work if you feel like you are well rested and you feel like you can, you know, you, you are well, both physically and mentally. So I always tell athletes who want to get into activism to prioritize um, their self-care. Um, I also, I talked a lot about, you know, institutional power and gaining access to institutional power. So for athletes on the call who want to do this work, try to utilize the structures you're operating in to your advantage, whether that's getting on a student athlete advisory committee, student government, um, gaining access to funding, try to get some access to institutional power so you can leverage your, your activist platform. And then finally, just build as many coalitions as you can. That's a lot of what my work is about um, with Gwen, with others, is to leverage the coalitions you can build on your campus, in your high school, 
in the industry and as um, Dr. Doug mentioned so powerfully beyond sport. Um, if you're on a college campus, you have a lot of resources beyond sport, tap into those, build those coalitions because they can elevate your, your activism. Great, Doug. Okay, yeah, I'm, gl I, I'm glad I'm next because I think Gwen should have the last word on this, um, no doubt. Um, I wanna emphasize the point about education and understanding. Um, sport or sport protest, none of, that ha none of the good stuff happens automatically. It's all about us knowing what we stand for and using the platforms and opportunities that we have. I think one of the real dangers of sport is, of ideal, sport idealism is we think good things happen just because we're sports fans or just because we're athletes. So that's where education, I think, informs us both about the social issues we care about and then how to think about the platforms that are available to us. Um, but I'll go back to your other question mate, more, um, Dr. Keela. I actually, and ironically, and unfortunately think it's extremely important for athletes to be good. Um, I think it's athletes who are tremendously excellent, genuinely exceptional, that have the biggest platform and command the most attention. Um, I think Gwen's a great example of that. I don't know, it sounded like you were a little disappointed with what you did this summer, but I was astounded at how you performed. And, and I think you wouldn't have had the platform and the voice that you had, had you not been that world champion, top level competitor. I, I think it's unfortunate because I stand for participatory sport and mass sport and that we should all have access to this. But the reality of our sporting hierarchies and cultures is that it demands excellence and it focuses the attention on those who are the great achievers. Um, and, and so that with that comes tremendous responsibility, uh, but, but tremendous responsibility both to be exceptional on, this, on the athletic field as well as um, in the social arena. And that to me, that's what I would end with. I think that's the big challenge is how to balance using that platform that sport provides you um, and stay true to it and be excellent in it with these other social issues. And I think, um, you know, like I would say a cautionary tale on that is somebody who I tremendously admire here from Minnesota, Maya Moore, who's done tremendous work um, on, on criminal justice reform and, and exoneration. But she did, she was most prominent when she was on the Lynx and the Lynx were winning championships. And since she's been out of that, she's still doing that great work, but it doesn't have the attention and prominence that come with that stage of athletic excellence. And that's a real challenge, I think, for all of us to grapple with, because it means we have to be great, not only at sport, but at activism, but maintain both of those. And that's a hard balancing act to do. Thank you, thank you. And our final comment, Gwen Berry, I'm gonna put a doctor to you. I'm gonna put a doctor. I know no. you're not there yet. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> but what you shared is, is, is of the essence of you. You're teaching a lot of that. So final comment from you, final thoughts. Yeah, for sure. So I wanna, of course, piggyback off of Dr. Yannick and Doug. Um, number one, education is extremely important. Um, but not only, you know, through just um, scholastic education as far as, you know, high school, um, college, I think self-education is imperative. You have to read books. You have to understand who you are to know what are you fighting for? What is your purpose in life? Because, you know, we have to think we're living in a whole world and everybody is literally just like a small, small, small part of that world. So in order to understand who you are um, and what you are fighting for, you have to be self-educated. Like, I feel like that was the main thing that kind of brought um, me out of my shell was going to a freedom school, getting a different type of education and not just, you know, a European centralized education. Um, I got a black education, which we are not taught enough about, um, something else that needs to be, you know, raised awareness to as far as um, institutions and legislation. Um, I feel like more truths need to be told about, you know, the importance of black people and, you know, discriminated minorities in America because we do make America. Um, and so I feel like, of course, as Dr. Yannick said, education is so important. Um, again, piggybacking off of Doug, I say it too. Unfortunately, you do have to be you know, a great athlete in order to demand that intention, attention 
and to, you know, make your statements heard. And honestly, I think it's the great athletes who are worldly, who think different and who want to, um, you know, shake the boat or, you know, just bring a different type of perspective to people because they are so different. They are so great. And if they can demand their bodies and they can command their bodies to do such great things, imagine what their minds can do. So Mm -hmm. I feel like, unfortunately, you do have to be a great athlete. Um, I remember when in 2020 and 2021, I wanted to quit to where I literally had to, again, talk to Dr. John Carlos about me not competing or training for the Olympic Games in 2021. I was literally like, you know, contemplating, should I quit? Should I stay? Because I was broke. And so when I talked to him, he gave me, um, you know, a great perspective as to why it was important for me to continue to be an elite athlete. And it was because of my platform. He said, when you standing on that podium, you are at the highest level. So everybody can see you. If you're not good, if you're not seen, if you're not heard, you cannot be effective. So I feel like that's important for athletes to understand. It is hard. I won't lie. You know, being an advocate for your community, being an elite athlete and being a world-class athlete is it's extremely hard. But if you prioritize and you understand why you're doing it, I feel like the sacrifice is you know, it's a no brainer for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know this conversation can go further. Um, We'll take it into a, a, out of this virtual space and I know definitely continue. So with that said, I want to thank, thank our amazing panelists, Dr. Doug Hartman, Dr. Yana Kluk and Gwen Berry for sharing your voice and sharing your insight on voices of athlete activism. At this point, we're gonna take a break, a sweet, a little commercial break, and we will join you in a few minutes um, for our change agent organizations that will be moderated by Dr. Amy August. Thank you so much, each and every one of you. And uh, again, we will see you in a few minutes for our next keynote conversation. 